Hey, thanks for being here today. It's good to see you all. We're going to have a good, hopefully a good conversation on the nature of political discourse today. If you want me to uh, tell you who to vote for, this is not that session, just so you know. But I am curious, how many of you can vote this election? Wow. There's a lot of you. Man, oh man. All right, good. All right, so vote for me, all right? Just put my name in there, see what happens. Who knows, we could have a movement, right? Uh, so who's Bill Harmon? Just give it a quick synopsis of who I am. Um, so I'm from Baltimore, Maryland, born and raised in Baltimore. Okay, just me. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, I went to uh, public elementary school, went to the Lutheran uh, middle school, and then I went to the Lutheran high school in Baltimore, and it was there that I realized that um, perhaps I wanted to go into ministry. My parents uh, are not pastors. My dad was not a pastor, and it was really the school that did that for me. I then attended Concordia Bronxville in New York, which is right there. Okay, four of us. Good, thank you. Uh, there, <laughs> thank you, Larry. And from there, from there, I went to Concordia St. Louis. I vickered in Warren, Michigan, just north of Detroit, and then my first church was in Flat Rock, Michigan, which is ne neither flat or rocky, just so you know. <laughs> if you ever visit there, you go, why do they call it Flat Rock? I don't even know. And then I served as associate pastor uh, at a church in Long Island, New York. Good pizza, good pizza there. And then I started the senior pastor at that same church, and I've been serving now for eight years as the senior pastor of King of Glory Lutheran Church in Williamsburg, Virginia. That is not the church. That's the governor's palace in Williamsburg, Virginia, because Williamsburg, Virginia is the first English settlement in the United States. So um, we dress in colonial garb every Sunday at our church. And we talk, we say, and thou would comest to the communion table. No, we don't do that, okay. Um, I, <laughs> while I was in seminary, I had the great privilege of working for Senator Jack Danforth of Missouri. A couple Danforth fans. He, was, he had just retired as United States Senator. He then became the ambassador to the United Nations under President George W. Bush. And um, I worked at his home. Uh, for him at his home and uh, engaged in many conversations with him. That does not make me an expert on politics, but I tell that to you because it shows you that I love politics. I love the two things that no one likes to talk about, right? Religion and politics. So um, I'm great company, just so you know. Um, and it was really, uh, I worked for Senator Danforth for three years and really gained a great appreciation for uh, a man of integrity um, who certainly had political opinion and um, philosophy, but always couched that um, with integrity and purpose. And so that's really what we'll focus on today. I am married to Gail, who is from Queens, New York. So she is currently stealing your car if you drove here today. Right? It never works anymore. <laughs> right? So when I lived in Long Island, see, the, the guys from New York are like, that's hilarious. When I lived in New York, I said that all the time. People would laugh. I moved to Williamsburg. They're like, ooh, that's, that's not, you shouldn't say that, Pastor. <laughs> Just so you know, all Gail Harmon jokes are approved. I made like seven jokes about Gail at the last presentation, and I didn't realize she was in the back the whole time. So now I need a place to stay tonight, if somebody could <laughs> give that to me. Gail is a second grade teacher. Uh, in Williamsburg, Virginia, and we have three beautiful sons. Jack is going to Longwood University next year. Max is a senior in high school, and Noah will be a freshman. And they uh, came to my last session, but clearly don't love me enough to come to this session. So shame on them. <laughs> All right. And this is our dog, Cooper. Um, he, he died like two months ago, but I didn't have another picture. So moment of silence for Cooper. Yeah, okay, good. All right. <laughs> so, so on to what he was a good dog, just so you know. Uh, so wh while we're talking today, I want you to be able to talk too. So if you want to add to the conversation, raise your hand. I'll be happy to come to you. Uh, uh, 
hear you and share, bless you, and hear what you have to say um, so that you can be part of the conversation as well um, because we want that to be the case. And certainly uh, share it with your friends. Uh, in fact, if you want to do your evaluations now, go ahead, just put fives. That'd be nice of you. Uh, that's how we vote here, right? In fact, I've done it for you. <laughs> no. So when, whenever you talk about politics and political conversations, one of the first steps to, I think, having a good, healthy conversation is knowing what the presupposition is of the person you're with. So an example of that is this. My wife and I went to a restaurant once, and uh, she says to the waiter, how do you like the pork sandwich? He says, oh, I hate the pork sandwich. And he said in such a way, I said to him, uh, do you like pork? He says, no, I hate pork. <laughs> so his presupposition on anything with pork is going to be bad, right? It it's important to know that because then you have a fuller understanding of why he's giving you that opinion. Maybe you read in my bio, one of the things that I really think is important that we lack these days is a 360-degree perspective of things. We tend to be very one-sided. We've lost the art of conversation. We've lost the art of disagreement. Now we live in a society, right, which is, if you don't agree with me, I hate you. If you don't agree with me, I'll do everything I can to make sure that no one will ever agree with you. So when it comes to politics, I think we have to have a presupposition conversation. And I think the first one is this. Um, when it comes to c politics in the United States, your presupposition might be the United States of America is a God-ordained Christian democracy. Now, if that's someone's presupposition, that is going to affect every part of their conversation. That this is a God-ordained Christian democracy. I live in Williamsburg, Virginia. The largest naval station in the world is an hour away. There are a lot of people who believe this. And so when anything horrible happens in this country, what's the first thing they say to me? Anyone know? Yeah. Yeah. We clearly have done something, and God is now mad at us. Because that's how you have to think if this is that. If this is that. I had a voicemail after the Dallas shootings from one of my members who said, please this Sunday preach that we as Christians have to get back on, no, I'm sorry, that we as Americans have to once again become a Christian country because God is punishing us. So I had to call her and say, well, let's, let's talk this through a little bit. There's something called the cross <laughs> where the wrath of God was achieved in the crucifixion of Christ. So why do these things happen? Well, there's, it's an imperfect world where terrible things happen, right? Or your presupposition is the United States of America is a great nation, but it is just like any other nation when it comes to the Lord. Now, listen. I don't want to get in a conversation or argument with you. Don't give me a one on the evaluation because you think that uh, I don't believe in American exceptionalism. All right? I'm not, I'm not having a conversation about that. It's not the topic of our day. I grew up with a father who's a Vietnam veteran. Thank God for his service. Um, who every night at the dinner table uh, told his son and daughter that the United States of America is the greatest country in the world. And if we would ever argue with him about that, usually with my sister, not me, for the record, he would reach over to his world book encyclopedia. <laughs> for those of you, that's Wikipedia in a book, okay? <laughs> and he would open up and say, it says right here. My mother travels every year somewhere in Europe with a bunch of ladies. My, my, every year, my mother says to my father, why don't you come with us? Why would I ever leave this country? This is the greatest country in the world. There's nothing else in the world to see but what's here. So my mother leaves him. See, I think he wants to go, but realizes, I'm going to have 10 days <laughs> by myself. I'm just saying, I think that's what he thinks, all right? So this is an important presupposition when you're having a conversation about politics. 
I don't mind telling you that I think it's the latter rather than the former. I, I think when you read through Scripture, there was only one nation <laughs> that had the, the, the triple star rating, right? And that was Israel. And we could have a great theological conversation of what Israel actually means now. If it means land or a people, physical land or a people. Again, this isn't that seminar. <laughs> but I think we see throughout Scripture and frankly throughout history that, that nations come and go. What remains? Anyone know? Yeah, the steadfast love of the Lord. So, first conversation has to be, what's your approach? So I'm curious, I'd like to do an unofficial vote. So hear me out when I say this. This is just more for perspective. This is a non-judgment vote. Everyone raise your right hand. Your right hand. <laughs> Repeat after me. This is a non-judgment vote. Non vote. So help me God. So help me God. Amen. Amen. This is the feast. No, stop repeating after me. <laughs> You're very good, I'll tell you. I want you at church. <laughs> Would some of you be on my church council? I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. We're not recording this, are we? All right. So this is an unofficial vote. There's no comments. Oh, my gosh, look, I just started, and there they go. Oh, there's two votes for you right there. <laughs> One, two. It's just like church. Okay. My church. I'm talking about my church, not your church. What? <laughs> people walk out and sit there. Like, they walk out me all the time. No, I'm kidding. So this is un <laughs> all right, focus, people, focus. This is an unofficial vote. So uh, what I mean by that is no comments. Just vote your conscience. So here's what I want you to do. As you're able, you'll stand to vote. Okay? No judgment. First thing is this. Who here would say they're a Republican? Please stand. Oh, I hear people. I shouldn't hear people. Hmm. Interesting. Thank you. Sit down. You may sit down. Who here would say they're a Democrat? <laughs> We're watching you. <laughs> <laughs> Sit down. So I'm just kidding. Sit down. Who would say they're independent? Hmm. <laughs> With a dab. Thank you. <laughs> so for those of you who couldn't see the whole perspective, there's a majority of people who identify Republican. And then I'd say next would be independent and then Democrat. Interesting. Okay. Should the government provide health care for everyone? Don't, hold on. <laughs> Should the government provide health care for everyone? If you think yes, stand. Okay, thank you. If you think no, stand. Interesting. So interesting. Thank you. Most everyone who stood for yes was millennial, just so you know. But there's a lot of millennials stood for no. Okay. All right, here we go. Should abortions continue to be legal? We'll do a hand vote on this one. Hand vote. Should abortions continue to be legal? Raise your hand for yes. Thank you. Raise your hand for no. Thank you. Let's pause just for a moment. Oh, I'll keep going. <laughs> what, I w what I want you to see is that even at the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synods, 
triannual national convention, no, national youth gathering, there's an eclectic group of people who don't all think the same way about the same things. And yet, we still can find unity. Keep going. Should the right to have a gun include machine guns and high-capacity clips or magazines? Should the right to have a gun include machine guns and high-capacity clips or magazines? So I just saw someone say, what does that mean? Because <laughs> you don't think I'm watching you, but I am. Should the right to have a gun include a machine gun? You know, a machine gun is a gun that shoots. <laughs> Some of you are actually doing it. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> right? Yeah, good. <laughs> or high capacity clips, meaning it's a gun that's been reformatted to, to have more ammunition in it than it was created for so that it can be changed over more quickly. Or magazines, which are magazines you put in the gun. Okay, so if you think yes, please stand. Thank you. I feel the tension. <laughs> <laughs> if you think no, please stand. Thank you. If you're abstaining, please stand. I heard you in the front row. He said, I'm not voting. <laughs> uh, oh, we already have arguments in the front row. <laughs> Crisis counselor to the front row, please. <laughs> this is a, hey, you, you think what you think. Okay, hang in there, hang in there. There's points to this, don't worry. Should the government deal with the national debt or just let it keep rising? If yes, it sh okay, so I'm gonna, don't worry, I'm gonna give it to you. So should the government deal with the debt? I'll give you an example, balanced budget, okay? Please stand. Thank you. Should we just keep on spending that spending? Please stand, there you go. <laughs> Own it, Own it. <laughs> Own it if it's you. Sit down. Thank you. Thank you, and I'll refrain from snarky comments, because if you can't do it, I can't do it, right? All right. Should same-sex couples have the right to be married? Should same-sex couples have the right to be married? If yes, please should. OK, we have a clarifying question which is, should the same-sex couples have the right to be married in a church so, or, or by the state? So I'll, I'm going to make it simpler. Should same-sex couples have a right to be acknowledged as married by the government? This is a conversation about politics. Please stand if yes. Thank you. No? A little more even. Thank you. <laughs> you got to ask the question, right? You got to ask the question. All right. Take a deep breath. Take a deep breath. Because frankly, only seven of you said you'd pay for it, all right? So hang in there. <laughs> should, should we build a wall around our borders? Please stand. That, that, you're not speaking. Thank you. Should we not? Wow, it's fascinating. 
Thank you. I think there's one more. Oh, no. All right. Okay, so let's talk about this a minute. Okay, F turn to the person next to you and say, I still love you. <laughs> all right, good, good. Okay, that's all. Just say that. Just say that. We don't, anyone, we don't want any wedding proposals here. Did you know, did you know that Chris, on the plane to the National Youth Gathering, proposed to his fiance and asked her to marry him. Isn't that sweet? <laughs> Congratulations. You see, there's something really smart about that. When you want to marry someone, have them confined to a place they can't leave. <laughs> what is she going to say? No, and then awkwardly sit there for two hours? No. She's going to say yes. Sorry. Sorry to burst that bubble. Okay. <laughs> Here's the first thing I want you to know. And look, I, I understand that I could get some letters and some phone calls from district. Pro I understand this, right? The first thing I want you to know is this. We all, we all think what we think. We all think what we think. Look, um, three years ago, uh, we had similar votes, and it was su it's surprising to me. This particular group is slightly more conservative than the last three years, just so you know. But I, ho I don't know if you could see, but on certain issues, you're 50-50 in this room. Isn't that interesting when you look at polling in our country? Now, what would be really fascinating, if we could, is to see where you are all from, if you near, live near a city, or if you're from a farming community, because that all plays a part. That's what they do. That's how they figure all this out. But my point to you today is this. If we're looking for pure unity in this world, we will never find it. And yet... We do have something that unifies us as a body of believers. And that unity is found in Christ alone. And therefore then, if our unity is found in Christ alone, because it's frankly not found in who, whether um, gay men and women should be able to get married, it's certainly not found in whether we should have abortions, it's certainly not found in whether we should have gun control, it's certainly not found in whether we should have border control, connected to my questions, hear me out, then how do we as the people of God engage each other, even in our differences, in the name of Christian unity? Because what I see now from my perspective is, we're very non-Christian when it comes to our conversations about politics. And I'll go a step further, risking unemployment. We're even unchristian when it comes to church politics. And that's not who God has called us to be. Because here's the truth. How many of you can vote again this election? No one will know who you're voting for but you. Unless, of course, you pull into the parking lot, you know, with your Trump, Sanders, Harmon stickers, right? Because <laughs> I'm sure after this, I'm going to go up in the polls. I'm telling you now, all right? Can you imagine me as the President of the United States? <laughs> what, what a horrific moment that would be, right? Where, where's, where's President Harmon for his inauguration? I think he went in the wrong door. <laughs> I think he's on the other side of the Capitol. Oh, Lord, that'd be terrible. All right. Where's his dog? I think it died. I don't know. Okay. <laughs> you laugh first. I heard it. <laughs> don't laugh and then, oh, me. I heard you laugh first. All right. <laughs> All right. Here's what we know, right? Oh. It'd be helpful if I actually did it for you. Watch this. I just pushed, I thought I pushed it. 
See, President of the United States. <laughs> Hey, this is Todd Wolf. He's the IT manager at my church. <laughs> if he weren't here, I'd be blaming him for this. But because he is here, it's clearly my fault. All right? <laughs> Vice president. Oh, wow. You don't know what you say. <laughs> you don't know what you say. All right, listen. What we know from the Bible is this. We know a couple things. One, we know that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, right? What we know is this. It's not just these people who've sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, sinners. It's all the people have fallen and fallen and are short of the glory of God. But isn't our nature, isn't our human nature to sit over here and say, Oh, you all smell like Bourbon Street, <laughs> which does smell, by the way, if you've not been down there, right? Look at you horrible people. Aren't we good? Aren't we good over here? Yeah. And don't they stink? That's what we do. But, and by the way, that is our sinful nature. It's, I always say most sins go back to the, what commandment? The first commandment, which is what? Thank God. Some of you know it, right? <laughs> Thou shalt have another gods before me. We can skip it, Todd, and just go to the next slide. Oh. Oh, it's a charging issue. <laughs> yeah. So we, we've all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, and part of that comes back to then when I have a desire to be God, right? And we do that all the time. It's our ego. It's our sense of self. We find security in those kinds of things. And so we want to point the finger and say, as long as I can make them look worse than me, then I'm okay. Instead of dealing with who we are as the people of God. Second thing we know as the, from the Bible is this. Not only have all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, but we also know that all are in need of the Savior, Jesus Christ. And that we have been called as the body of Christ to do what? As the body of believers, what's our calling? To be his hands and feet? Raise your hand, please. Be his hands and feet? Yeah? Make more believers. Yeah? Make more believers. Yeah? Be kind. Love thy neighbor and thyself. Right? Anyone else? So we love God. We love our neighbors. We're forgetting one. Love who else? Your enemies. Oh, Jesus, why'd you say that? <laughs> right? Um, not you. You're, I don't think your name is Jesus, is it? Uh, okay. I meant Jesus like Jesus. Yeah. I mean, it's okay to love God. That's hard enough. It's okay to love our neighbors, but then to love our enemies, bless you, is even more challenging, is it not? So, so pause for a moment. What's the most ridiculous political statement you've heard somebody say to you? Raise, you're going to raise your hand. I want to hear the most ridiculous political statement. Now, when they say it, you cannot make a comment. Yes, ma'am. I'm voting for Hillary Clinton because I want to see a woman in the White House. Okay. Oh, I thought you were clapping. No, no slapping your leg. Yes. <laughs> Boy, you guys are very... We should build a wall around Mexico and make them pay for it, right? Okay. <laughs> yeah. America should just nuke all the other countries in the world, right? <laughs> Reason number three, I'm not the president, just so you know. 
Like, what did Sweden say to me? Bam! There you go, Sweden. Sorry. <laughs> oh, we like Sweden. I'm sorry. Take it back. Yeah, yes. Somebody said to you that Donald Trump is God? Wow. I, refer them to me, will you? Okay. For a theological conversation. Yeah. Yes. When, so you heard Donald Trump say he can kill a man and still win. Wow. All right. Yes. When Donald Trump said John McCain was a really bad guy, we all know that, but we know what he did really well. Yeah, so when Saddam Hussein, when, no, <laughs> Saddam Hussein, when Donald Trump said, um, uh, was complimenting Saddam Hussein in keeping terrorism down. Right. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Donald Trump is the next Adolf Hitler, all right? We gotta get you a better hat, by the way, but, but thank you for saying that, <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's just, a, it's just, a, just an observation, that's all. Yeah. So Donald Trump's saying we should deport Muslims, okay? I, you're asking me, I don't know, you have to ask him, but uh, yes, yes. At this point, Joseph Stalin should be president. <laughs> Are we ready or no? One more, yeah. We should first pass the bill and then read the bill. <laughs> <laughs> we should pass the bill, then read the bill, right? <laughs> yeah. Last one, and I want you to see this. Yeah. The Holy Bible is a good book, but God sometimes imposes what is better. <laughs> the Holy the Holy Bible is a good book, but Donald Trump says his book is a close second. Okay. Yes. <laughs> Say that again. Ted Cruz is a Zodiac killer. Ted Cruz is a Zodiac killer. <laughs> I don't know what that means. Okay, but a, a slight side note. I thought it was very ironic that there are fortune tellers outside of the Catholic Basilica. Did anyone else find that ironic, right? I just thought it was a little strange. And I told my group that I think by, before I leave, I'm going to go over and I'm going to turn the tables over and I'm going to say, in the name of Jesus, I shut this down. And then I'll say, but of course you knew that, right? Okay, so <laughs> think about it. Think about it. They're fortune tellers. Thank you. I'm here tomorrow, too. Okay. Take a look at this. For many, these are difficult times. A lot of good people are finding themselves in tough situations. Some are losing their homes. Others are losing their jobs. And many more are losing hope that things will ever get better. As a nation, we are calling for change. There are those of the opinion that the answers to their problems lie within the government, that somehow a certain president or a political party is going to be able to offer the change we need. In reality, no government, political party, or president is equipped to offer genuine hope for a better future. The problems we face are symptoms of a greater complication that plagues our world. It's a sickness that cannot be healed by the leader of a country or through the passing of laws. It is a disease that can only be cured by the one who brings true hope. It will not come from the man or woman who campaigns outward change, but from the one who changes us within. I think we tend to forget this. I think we come to a national youth gathering, maybe we go to church on Sunday or a Bible study, and we get filled with the Holy Spirit and with this truth that the only one who can bring true peace, true truth, true justice is the Prince of Peace, the mighty God, the Holy Counselor, the mighty Counselor, our Savior and God. But then something happens to us. We go home. We go out in the streets, we watch the, we watch the news, excuse me, and then somehow we turn off the Christian in us, <laughs> and then 
find ourselves building a frustration for what's happening around us. It almost seems like a lack of control, right? I, I, could you feel it happening in here? As I went around and had people say statements, I could feel some of the, some of the pressure building up in here with, uh, with people's thoughts and people's opinions and, and people's presuppositions uh, to the political discourse of the day. Look, I'll be the first one to admit to you this. It stinks. I have said, wh whether you're voting for Hillary Clinton or Donald Trump or the other two people, I can't remember their names at the moment, Gary Johnson, and there's a Green Party lady, I don't remember her name, Jill Stein. Listen, this is the best we have. Hear me out. This is the best we have as far as discourse. This is the best we have as far as representing who we are. Look, like or not, the Bible's not a history book. There's a lot of history in it. It's filled with history, but it's not a history book. The Bible is not a science book. Boy, there's a lot of science in it. And I don't believe that we have to divorce science from Bible. But it's not a science book. It's certainly not a math book, and trust me, the book of Numbers is not a book of Numbers, just so you know, all right? It's not like, turn to chapter 4. Look, there's a big 4, right? <laughs> That's not how it works. Look, ba you know this if you were in confirmation. I'm not telling you anything new. The Bible is the path for salvation. It teaches us the way, the truth, the life. That's what we use the Bible for. There's nothing more frustrating to me than to see politicians misuse Scripture. They love to do it, by the way. But what's worse is when Christians are doing it. It's sort of my, pet, my, my Merry Christmas pet peeve, which my folks will know, which is our expectation should not be that the lady at Target says Merry Christmas to you. My expectation is that you're saying Merry Christmas to her. Who said we're the ones to be making disciples, right? Not necessarily a Target, although Target's a fine place. So I know you work for Target. So, <laughs> so here's our first, look at these scripture passages. If you want to open up in your really bulky Bible they gave you, you can do that. It's a good, by the way, it's a good Bible. It's just a little bulky. Ephesians 2, 18 to 20. For through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer, say it, strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. Built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being what? Born. Yeah, do you see that? Your homeland is not this land. As baptized children of God, you became a new creation. You became citizens of heaven. Philippians 3, 19 to 21. Their end is destruction. Their God is their belly. And they glory in their shame with minds set on earthly things. But our citizenship is where? Heaven. Don't be mad at me. I sense some of you already are. Be mad at God. Our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we wait a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body for the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. By the way, notice what Jesus did. He did what everyone was disappointed that he didn't do when he first came. The disciples struggled with Jesus all the time. Does anyone know why the disciples struggled with Jesus? Raise your hand if you think you might know. Why the disciples maybe struggled with Jesus. Yes. That's right. They wanted him to come and conquer Rome. They wanted him to be a political figure. But Jesus 
Jesus wasn't that short-sighted. <laughs> Jesus had the eternal things in mind. And so he came to usher in a new life for us. And so here's what we know from Psalm 46. Kingdoms rise and fall. Egypt was a great nation. Rome was a great nation. Greece was a great nation. Praise God, we're a great nation. I, I'm happy about that. Trust me. But we don't worship a nation. Psalm 118, it's better to put your trust in God than in who? Men. We put our trust in God, not people. So not to disappoint Mr. Trump, but his book is not even a close second. And look, I get it. The, the nature of the political discourse, right? Commercials, radio programs, TV hosts, they build this up that these men or women are the greatest of all time in any way. I don't think Scripture supports that. Even when, even when the Israelites asked for a king, God warned them, you'll be disappointed. And eventually they were. John 14.30 tells us what? Somebody open to John 14.30 for me. John 14.30, it's a gospel. It's the fourth gospel. And da da da, -da spoiler alert, it's written by John. John, oh, I can't see it. 14.30. Who's got it? Front row, yeah. Um, just a second. Almost 30. Okay. Uh, 29.30. I will no longer talk much with you, for the ruler of this world is coming. He has no claim on me, but I do as the Father has commanded me, so that the world may know that I love the Father. Rise, let us go from here. Who is the ruler of this world? No. <laughs> I need a pastor. All right, not a pastor. Is it Satan? Yes. God is not of this world. So why is this all important for this conversation? Look, we trust in God. No one can take that away from us, right? But our expectations have to be adjusted if we think that we are doing things to to keep something that we know ultimately will fail us. We're not of this world, right? So my question to you is, why the surprise? And I, I'll be honest with you, now hear me out. I've been very, very surprised lately, <laughs> just so you know. But if we've all fallen, if we live in a world that's, that's plagued with sin then why are we surprised that these events are taking place? And we shouldn't be surprised that certain decisions are being made. In fact, our expectation should be this. It's going to get worse. Jesus warns us that this is going to be a time of suffering, that, that bearing the name of Christ means to suffer in some way. And so our focus should not waver or change, but our, but our surprise should not be overreaction is what I'm saying. Don't mishear me. I'm not saying don't be Christian. Absolutely be a Christian. But I find it surprising when we act surprised when this world seems like it's going to hell in a, what's the phrase? Handbasket. Hand not sure what that means, but it sounds good, and I can say hell without getting in trouble. <laughs> All you have to do is read through the Old Testament, read through the New Testament, and you'll see that this isn't much of a surprise. So what do we do? What do we do when people say, hey, we should have a woman because we need a woman, or hey, we should have Donald Trump because he'll build a wall, or hey, let's have Stalin, or whatever these people have said, right? What do we do? The the first thing that we tempted or do, we're tempted to do is to react and not respond. I can't believe I can't believe you said that. 
How dare you say that? Whatever, right? But our calling is to be the light. So someone in the, this whole section here, turn to Matthew 5, 14 to 16. This back section, turn to Matthew 22, 35 to 41. Acts 1, 8 here. And Philippians 2, 9, 11. Here's what I'm forcing you to do that I know you don't like to do in political discourse. You all want me to stand up here and tell you what I think. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what I think. What matters is what he says. What matters is what he says. Trust me. You can take me for beignets tomorrow and coffee, and I'll be happy to tell you what I think. I'm not shy to do that. But I'm pressing upon you as your pastor for an hour, that our thinking cannot be void of God's word. Matthew 5, 14 to 16, who's going to read it? Stand up, be bold. Say, say it's so loud you don't need this microphone. Your lives, by the way, superb job. You should definitely be in church work. All right. Notice what Matthew says. You're the light of the world. A city on a hill can't be hidden. Why are you worried about what everyone's saying? A city on a hill can't be hidden. When you have the light, the light shines, period. And by the way, you shine the light for one reason and one reason only, and that is, you said it before. So, oh, to make more believers. Yeah, so people know him. So when you're voting your conscience, you say, how will people know him through me in this conversation and this vote? Back, somebody, bold, strong, courageous, read it. Yeah, do it. Bold, strong, courageous, powerful. Good job. Thank you. The only bad thing about what you did was the case on your phone. But other than that, it was, you know, unfortunate Yankee case. But other than that, it was good. What, what, Vice President, this is not your time, okay? So uh, the, what is the greatest what? Commandment. You are commanded to love God and each other. Back section, other side, bold, strong, stand up. Yeah, wow, muscles. <laughs> oh, everyone looks now when I say that, don't they? So, uh, where do you live? <laughs> They're only clapping because you have muscles, just so you know. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Like, oh, wait, so, like, and uh, what do you eat? I'm just kidding. Good, thank you. Good job. Good job back there. <laughs> so, take a deep breath in this world. At the name of Jesus, Every knee will bow, and every tongue will confess. You're, you're working too hard. <laughs> Jesus is in control here. All right, quick, son in the front. Yes. Oh, 
Double. Both at the same time. One, two, three. Double applause. <laughs> Last thing I want you to know. What has God given you? His what? His Holy Spirit. I love to say this. I love to say this. Look, everyone look at me. Everyone look at me. Everyone. <laughs> the same Spirit of God that empowered Peter, a fisherman, to preach a message where 3,000 came to faith is the same spirit given you. The same spirit of God that led disciples to go heal the sick is the same spirit given to you. The same spirit of God that led the disciples to raise the dead is the same spirit given to you. The question for you is, when's the last time you called upon that spirit? Or are you making this all about you? See, for Christian political discourse, we have to first worry about where we are before we about worry about where they are. So I had to say to myself, am I still the light of the world? Is Jesus so powerful to me that my knee bows and my tongue confesses? Am I recalling this moment in this time, as horrific as things are, in the political discourse that we have, that the Holy Spirit of God has chosen me to be his temple. Okay, now I'm ready to have a conversation about politics. Don't get me wrong. We have responsibilities in this world. Sorry. Pay your taxes. We prayed for President Obama in our church, I don't know, many times. I had an email from a lady saying, I cannot believe that you prayed for President Obama. So I wrote her, I said, first you should know that I used the official prayers of the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod. <laughs> I hit print, and they print it, and I used them, right? So call Dr. Harrison, not me. I didn't write them. And two, you are commanded to do it. It doesn't say pray for the leader you like. And by the way, I suggest to you, if you don't like President Obama, that's all the more reason to pray for him. And if you do, of course you do. We're to be witnesses. One of, one of Paul's greatest desires was to be a witness to Felix. To give witness to the politician of the day. And of course, we look at Jesus himself as our ultimate witness on how we're to act. So Jesus saw sinners, and he went to them. <laughs> Jesus knelt at his disciples' feet, and he washed them. He stood before the governor. He, he, could, have, he could have nuclear bombed Pontius Pilate, which is what you would have done. I know it. I know you would have done that. You have on your shirt, press on. And you pressed it, you would have nuked him, right? <laughs> Jesus just took it. Just stood there. Because he knew what he was and who he was was beyond the standards of this world. And look, we have the right kingdom and the left kingdom. And, and Martin Luther is very clear about that. And, and this is not a conversation that you should not be engaging in those things that are in this world. In fact, we're told to be in this world, but what? Not right. And so we, we are in this world for a very specific reason, and that is to be the light of Christ. But all times what happens, right? We start getting that conversation about abortion. We get in that conversation about guns. We get in that conversation about the wall, and we quickly become of it. We quickly become of it. Instead of removing ourselves and saying, how can this conversation give glory to God? And we should be involved. Look, you have all the rights and responsibilities of a citizen of the United States of America. And you should utilize them to your greatest. 
speak out. You want to go to a rally? Go to a rally. You want to put a bumper sticker in your car? <laughs> One of my favorite times ever, man met, met with me in my office, and, he, and uh, some, some Virginians have a more southern accent than others. This gentleman had a particularly rich southern accent. He goes, Reverend Harmon, I'm meeting with you. Do you know that there is a car in your parking lot with an Obama sticker on it? <laughs> what are you going to do about that, Reverend? I said, well, uh, nothing. I don't know. <laughs> what do you want me to do about it, right? <laughs> Speak out. Run. Hey, I have an idea. Run for office. I don't mean like right now as you walk out the door, but I mean run for office. Uh, there'd be nothing better than to hear you be the next congressperson or senator or president of the United States. I would love it. But we shouldn't do things like a crusader. <laughs> but remember, we're a new creation. 1 Corinthians 13, 4 to 7. Turn there for me. 1 Corinthians 13, 4 to 7. Bum, bum, ba, ba. Um, but it's read at every wedding I've ever done. Uh, right? I need someone bold and courageous to read it. Clearly, all the bold and courageous people just left. Um, the gentleman in the back beat you. I'm sorry to tell you. But you are bold and courageous. Yes, read it. Okay, that's good. Come up here, please, as quickly as you possibly can. Yeah. Let's give a hand for the guy we don't know. Hey, how are you? Hi. You're much taller up here than you are back there. Just, you know. What's your name? I'm Kevin. Where are you from? Fort Wayne, Indiana. It's your birthday? Unfortunately. Okay. We'll sing at the end, okay? All right. I've already, I've already got, he says, please don't. We'll vote on it, <laughs> and then we'll decide. And you're from Fort Wayne, Indiana? Yeah. Okay. And what's your favorite thing to eat in Fort Wayne, Indiana? Um, the corn's good, pretty good. The corn, good answer. All right. <laughs> Open the Bible back up. First thing, love is what? Patient. Patient. This is not a wedding verse. It's a you verse. God commands you to love who? Your neighbor, him, him, and your enemies, right? So love is what? Patient. What is it? Kind. Ah, it's kind. By the way, God doesn't say only love those who love you. He says you love them, right? So be patient, be kind, connect. It does not envy. It does not envy? Or boast. Or boast? Uh-oh. We're tempted to do that, right? Um, it's not arrogant or rude, or rude, right? Well, most politicians are out of that one, right? <laughs> right? It's not arrogant or rude. What I want you to do is to receive this for you. It does not insist on its own way. Ooh. ooh. Next. It is not ir irritable or resentful. Okay. Next. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing. Ah. Do you hear all that? I know, I know you're, you, you hear those and you know how we've all not done them. If we're to be the light of the world and to love, even in our politics, then we have to not be, pa we have to, we have to be patient and kind, not rude, not envious, not self-serving. We have to remember who we are. We have to remember who we represent. Remember his desires for our lives and his desires for the lives of the people that we encounter. Here's the thing. When Jesus died on the cross, he died for everybody. Even the Democrats, even the Republicans, even the Green Party. And so I think one thing we have to remember, too, is that they bear the light as well. And therefore, we should engage them as we would engage someone just like us. 
stay here. We have a vote coming. So as you go about your lives engaging the political discourse of this society, the first question that you have to answer is, who will I be? Because the temptation will be to point out who everyone else is. And my suggestion to you is, that is the breakdown of political discourse. You're not worrying enough about you. But rather, you're worrying about everybody else. And if you can be patient and kind and not arrogant or rude or not rejoice in the wrongdoing of others, if you can speak the truth in love and remember that your responsibility is to be the light of the world <laughs> and that the Holy Spirit of God empowers you to be that light and that nothing can take that away, I think you'll find your discourse a little more different and your hope for the life you live a little bit greater. You can reach out to me by twittering, tweeting. Hey, you got, someone's got to make new words. I'm happy to do it. Twittering. I, 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 I invented Snapfish, which is not a thing, but I have it. Here's our church website. And uh, I'd, be, I'd love to continue the conversation with you. And I hope that you'll continue the conversation as well. I understand. Please, last point, and then we'll vote. I know it's hard to come to a seminar where it ends with worry about you. <laughs> but I'm suggesting to you that as Christian people, we deny ourselves and pick up our crosses and follow Jesus, and then that's how we act and live and interact with all people, rich, poor, Christian, non-Christian, legal, illegal, whatever it is. The first place we start the conversation is here. Thank you, everybody. Have a good day.